Good. Uh, good afternoon. My name is John Herbst, and I run the Eurasia Center here at the Atlantic Council. I'm delighted to be here with you this afternoon. We have a wonderful event for you. Uh, I'm known for the fastest introductions at the Atlantic Council, and I'm going to keep that up. Uh, so we have um, an excellent array of speakers, uh, but you have their bio, so I'm not going to describe them to you. Uh, we're going to start today with a keynote address from the Ambassador of Kazakhstan. Uh, and before he actually gives the keynote address, we have a short video, correct, Mr. Ambassador? So, um, Adrian, take it away. Kazakhstan. It's a huge country at the very heart of Eurasia and an active player in the international arena. Today, the largest international trade corridors pass through Kazakhstan. This creates broad economic opportunities. We are the key land bridge of the modern Silk Road that connects the European, Asian, and Middle Eastern markets, where 65% of the world's GDP is generated. Investing in Kazakhstan is easy and rewarding. Investment projects cover various sectors, IT, agriculture, processing industry, mineral industry, mechanical engineering, petrochemistry, tourism. All conditions and guarantees are insured for foreign investors. This enabled the attraction of more than 300 billion U.S. dollars to Kazakhstan's economy. The country has signed 49 international agreements guaranteeing investors' rights. There are 12 special economic zones where investors are exempt from taxes and customs duties. The Astana International Financial Center operates based on the English law principle. The AIFC Court and the International Arbitration Center protect investors' rights in Kazakhstan. All these benefits guarantee long-term stability of your investments. Kazakhstan, a country with unique economic opportunities. Well, good afternoon, um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished friends. It is a both a privilege and honor to address you all at this timely event focusing on uh, discussion of soft and uh, uh, infrastructure in Central Asia. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the authors, Ariel Cohen and James Grant, for preparing this wonderful report. Uh, to begin with, I would like also uh, to thank good friends of Kazakhstan, Ambassador Herbst, and uh, President of the ITIC, Dan Veet, for hosting us here today. We appreciate your interest in Kazakhstan as well as future course of, for political and economic development of Central Asia. I would like to begin uh, this talk by identifying what we today distinguish as a hard and soft infrastructure. When speaking of hard infrastructure, one may largely refer to physical network necessary for functioning of modern industrial nation. Whereas soft infrastructure refers to all the institutions which are required to maintain the good governance, legal, and social standards of the country. In many ways, Kazakhstan is successfully combining both hard and soft infrastructure in its development. As you are all aware, this year my country has reached a major milestones and so significant changes. The founding father, first, first president of Kazakhstan, Yelbasa Nursultan Nazarbayev, stepped down after devoting 27 years of service to building a modern Kazakhstan. Following this historic event, the competitive election took place on June 9, 2019, and has reinforced our country's principal position on democracy. The people of Kazakhstan made a choice for peaceful and stable development of our country. The new president of Kazakhstan, Kasim Jamar Tokayev, is paying special attention to ensure that the process of transformation and modernization of the country will get eventual success. Therefore, it is of vital importance to make sure Kazakhstan will remain a part of a global economic transformation and keep pace with the new geopolitical realities. In this sense, we 
are on track towards comprehensive reforms amid a, a rapidly changing international and domestic environment. As President Tokayev has recently noted in his interview to the Wall Street Journal, without political transformation, Kazakhstan will not be a success story. Without political reforms, we will be, there will be no progress in economic development of the country. President initiated the establishment of the National Council of Public Trust in order to promote more efficient dialogue between government and civil society. Its first meeting took place in September and received a lot of positive feedback. In our str strategic vision, youth support is crucial for state development. New leader announced plans to handpick a most promising young men and women under 35 into presidential shortlist for assuming key positions in the government. For the past 20 years, Kazakhstan has always been among the largest growing economies in the world. We are committed to maintain a 5% annual growth to become one of the 30th most competitive nations within the 30 years. It is our long-term goal, and we will be working diligently to achieve that goal. We have been a leader, leading FDI destination in Central Asia, surpassing in terms of attracted investments all of the other countries of Central Asia combined. Kazakhstan is committed to remain the leader in this uh, respect, and we have sufficient comparative advantage to do that. According to the World Bank Doing Business 2019 report, Kazakhstan is ranked number 25 overall ahead Iceland, of Iceland, Austria, Russia, Japan, Spain, and number one in protecting of minority investors out of 190 countries. We are also number 59 globally in the Heritage, Heritage Foundation Index of Economic Reform, uh, Economic Freedom, sorry. More telling is that we are number 12 in the Asia Pacific reg region, trailing only to the countries and territories like Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, Korea, etc. And of course, we are firm number one in Central Asian region. Kazakhstan is working on raising its standards, laws, regulations, and implementation practice to the OECD level. Ultimately, we want to gain full membership of this organization, the rationale behind this work is defined by, by our cho choice of development path. The government of Kazakhstan will continue to further improve the investment climate through ensuring rule of law, sanctity of the contracts, and protecting intellectual property rights. Our goal is to maintain stability and predictability for foreign investors. Kazakhstan is a sizable market in itself. We have more than 18.5 million people with GDP per capita close to $27,000 in PPP terms. In our, our close integration uh, with neighbors provide consist, uh, convenient access to adjacent markets. Today, more than 500 million people live in the immediate vicinity of our borders, including Western China, 300 million, countries of the Caspian Basin, 150 million, and Central Asia, 60 million people. Kazakhstan serves as an important transport hub connecting East and West. Over 70% of trans transcontinental routes go through Kazakhstan. For the last decade, Kazakhstan invested $30 billion in transport infrastructure, including the dry port of Horgos on the border with China, the ports of Aktau and Kurik on the Caspian Sea, its own terminal in the Chinese port of Lianyungan with access to the countries of Southeast Asia. We also completed 900 kilometers long railway corridor, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Iran. Now it connects the countries of Central Asia with the Persian Gulf. The International Transit Corridor, Western Europe, Western China, allows to reduce the time of trans transporting goods from ports of China to Baltic Sea to 15 days, while shipping by sea takes three, four times longer. The Belt and Road Initiative creates a new geoeconomic paradigm. 
partnered with Kazakhstan Nurlijol State Program. It all it allows to reposition entire region, including regions including Central Asia, and in particular Kazakhstan in the global context. Needless to say that we will continue very close cooperation with our, with our immediate neighbors and partners like Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and other countries of Central Asia. Kazakhstan is a young country. Kazakh millennials accounts for roughly 44% of the total population and a staggering 40% of its workforce. We view human capital development as a catalyst for overall sustainable development of our country. As a nation that wants to stay abreast of global trends, we are continuously developing our educational system. Kazakhstan is ranked fourth among 137 countries of the world on the primary education enrollment rate. In the ranking of the World Bank Human Capital Index 2018, our country placed 31st just two spots behind the United States. Kazakhstan is on a par with the most developed countries of the world with 100% literacy. A vivid example of our attention to, the, to education at the highest level is the presidential program Bolashak, and you all know that. Currently, there are about 11,000 Bolashak scholars. They have studied at the best universities of the world, a significant number of them here in the United States. We understand that the high quality education is a result of huge investment in human capital. Therefore, in five years period, we are planning to increase our expenditures on education and science to 10% of GDP. Overall, we have set a goal to become a center for education and science in the region. Kazakhstan-US bilateral relations are based on many important pillars. The United States was the first country to open its diplomatic mission and has been a reliable partner for many years supporting our independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. We attach great importance to implementing landmark agreements reached during, the, during <coughs> the official visit of the first president, Nusultan Nazarbayev, to the United States in January 2018 that laid the ground for enhanced strategic partnership between our countries. <coughs> Kazakhstan is aimed at promoting mutually beneficial economic partnership with the United States that increases bilateral trade and investment as well as creates jobs and opportunities in both countries. The US is one of the largest investors in Kazakhstan with total investments exceeding 45 billion. The US invest investment have been pivotal for our development all these years and will remain priority as we aim to increase long-term engagement of the American businesses in our economy. Given the US leadership in innovation and cutting edge technologies, we are interested in attracting best practices and advanced knowledge to Kazakhstan. Energy Corporation has been a backbone of our economic engagement. We appreciate our cooperation with Chevron, ExxonMobil, Honeywell, General Electric, and many other others to be mentioned today. Currently, we are exploring a vast opportunities in agriculture and high-tech industries. And as ambassador of Kazakhstan to the United States, I will make sure that our partnership continues to diversify and expand across all sectors and industries. Dear friends, uh, Kazakhstan welcomes and promotes positive dynamics in Central Asian region for boosting our trade, economy, and commerce, as well as people-to-people -people relations. We work with our immediate neighbors across a wide range of partnership. However, Central Asia's geographical location provides both opportunities and challenges. Being a landlocked region, we face limitations in our economic growth prospects. This and other issues of regional integration and economic development are discussed within the C5 plus one dialogue in partnership with the United States. Just last month, Kazakhstan and other Central Asian foreign ministers 
met with the Secretary Pompeo to address common goals on security and economic growth. Following its success, we had trade and investment framework agreement meeting on the margins of the World Bank and IMF annual uh, session. We believe that this dialogue is important for stability as well as increasing intra-regional connectivity. So this is in brief our uh, uh, overview of the current state of affairs in Kazakhstan and environment we live in. I would be delighted to hear your assessment and views as well, exchanging opinions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I want to, first of all, thank my co-author, James Grant, and uh, thank the excellent team of interns who helped us, Sam Oswald, uh, Dave, uh, David Pasmanik, uh, Ming Jin, do not hear, Tair Kazikhanov, and Agbota Karibaeva. Everybody here? Yes. Um, and Natasha. And Natasha, of course, and Natasha. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, last year uh, we did uh, the first report of International Tax and Investment Center focusing on uh, infrastructure of Central Asia. This is a major element of Belt and Road. It w without Central Asia, without infrastructure in Central Asia that would connect China and the Pacific region with Europe and the Middle East, Belt and Road will not occur. China today is reevaluating uh, its commitment to Belt and Road. It is indeed a mammoth undertaking. But beyond the nuts and bolts infrastructure, beyond those railroads and bridges and airports, there's something else that is absolutely vital in economic development. And that element is what we call, for lack of better shorthand, better word, is soft infrastructure. What does that mean? You have the report outside. Please don't be shy. Take a copy. And I hope you at least will take it on the plane and read it. It's not that long. Uh, but the absolutely vital element to attract investment, to make these projects economically efficient, not just white elephants that you know, people can brag about, uh, but something that really works for investors and for the public, for, for the voters, if you wish. Uh, these are the elements of soft infrastructure, laws, regulation, courts, customs, customs rules, dispute resolution mechanisms. Without that, Central Asia, unfortunately, may lag behind. And the reason why Western Europe, the United States, and the emerging market economies elsewhere are succeeding is because these institutions are working. So, the, these are the intertwined elements of economic development, the hard infrastructure and the soft infrastructure. So when we talk about hard infrastructure, Central Asia is struggling against the legacy of the Soviet era and before that of the Tsarist Empire. It was not originally, despite Astana International Financial Center that uses the English law, it was not originally the uh, birthplace of the common law. Um, unfortunately, also, when you look at the World Bank um, statistics, corruption is still the greatest challenge. While ease of doing business, as Ambassador mentioned, 
uh, in Kazakhstan in particular is world class, uh, 28th, right? 25th uh, in the world. But in the rankings of corruption, is Central Asia is still, unfortunately, uh, pretty low. But the region needs to attract $33 billion of infrastructure development investment by 2030. And we're almost in 2020, so 10 years, 3.3 billion a year on average. This is a challenge that these countries have to overcome. Um, good governance more broadly, not just the corruption issues, but good governance. When you go to Kazakhstan, as I do a couple of times a year, you hear complaints about red tape, about bureaucracy. And in other countries, it's even worse. So how do you streamline bureaucracy? This is not limited to Central Asia. Every place in the world, you know, for those of you who ever tried to contract US government, good luck. The amount of paperwork that you need to undergo to get even a small contract is quite challenging. So this is another issue you need to keep in mind uh, <coughs> when you're trying to develop this soft infrastructure. Um, OK, we talked about corruption. We talked about ease of doing business. Um, let's see. Fair and effective tax regimes, a subject that is close to our heart at the ITIC, International Tax and Investment uh, Center. Uh, taxation is an integral part of country's development policy that provides the funding required to build and operate infrastructure on which economic development and growth are based. Taxation has to be reasonable, transparent, and well managed. The simpler, the better. Uh, so this is something the countries are uh, dealing with. Uh, in 2019 this year, the government of Uzbekistan has undertaken a major initiative to improve and simplify taxation. Uh, it was um, acknowledged by the International Monetary Fund and, of, uh, and by the World Bank. Um, in some countries, it is not uh, as successful as in Kazakhstan. In Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, unfortunately, as a very centralized and corrupt country, um, does not uh, gain a lot of uh, good grades uh, in, the er in these areas, including taxation. Uh, so some countries have their tax reforms ahead of them. Uh, Ambassador, how am I doing on time? So, um, no? three OK. Three minutes left? I'll give you three more minutes. Thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> Uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, needs to pursue a tax reform to facilitate small and medium uh, enterprises to grow in their uh, share of the economy. I would say in general small and medium enterprise uh, is uh, something that creates jobs, that diversifies the economy. And speaking of economic diversification, till this day 60 to 70 percent of um, the production in Central Asia is fuel and minerals. And as we're looking over the horizon, as we're seeing how much time oil has, in my opinion, 30 to 40 years, as a major transportation fuel, uh, a lot of emphasis needs to be put uh, on diversification. I think Kazakhstan is doing a decent job, at least acknowledging it and pushing it. Other countries. Turkmenistan with its gas. It's Dutch disease, classic <coughs> case of Dutch disease. So much money is coming through, exports of gas, other um, sectors are not so competitive. Overall, uh, the region um, increased its GDP uh, since the independence from the Soviet Union by uh, times nine, 900%. Uh, that's Impressive, but I would say the low-hanging fruit was already collected and eaten. So what I was talking about in terms of diversification, in terms of finding industries that add value, like Astana International Financial Center, uh, like high-tech, like uh, niche 
agriculture with export potential to the markets in China, Russia, and Europe. Uh, these things, these uh, economic sectors are the future for Central Asia, as well as, of course, <coughs> transportation and the traditional sectors such as oil, gas, petrochemicals, uh, mining, and others. Um, one particular um, emphasis in the report is looking at how these countries can attract investment. We're talking about pr uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, Kazakhstan has the law uh, and has uh, a couple of government uh, nodes or centers that deal with that. Other countries a little bit lagging behind, but they'll get there because this is for big infrastructure projects, for airports, for uh, important roads. This is a proven method of attracting multi-billion dollar investments, but you have to have the laws, the regulations, and good governance to allow them to function. Um, finally, attracting FDI, there is a challenge in the region in terms of um, dependence on the Chinese credit. The Chinese credit was criticized by the leaders of the US foreign policy and by leaders in other uh, countries, in Burma, in Malaysia, in uh, Sri Lanka, that these uh, credits create a burden on the economies. So uh, my suggestion is diversify the sources of your investment. Do not depend on one creditor too much. And with that, I think uh, I will <coughs> stop here and encourage you to pick up the paper on your way out. Arrow, that was great. Uh, we're lucky to have with us folks who watch very carefully um, trade and investment. And in fact, um, Tara Blake can talk about this as seen from the Hawkeye perspective of OPIC. So your comments on the sure. paper would be welcome. So first let me introduce OPIC. OPIC is the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. We are the US government's development finance institution. Um, we operate in the same way that IFC, EBRD, ADB would work, except that we have, we're bilateral. Um, some of you have probably heard of the BUILD Act. Um, and that is legislation that was passed a year ago that will change our name, will give us a higher capacity, um, and in some respects will give us more tools to counter Belt and Road, at least that was the intent. Um, in reality, um, it will benefit some Central Asian countries more than others in that right now OPIC requires that there be a U.S. participation in every project that we invest in. Um, and that is a metric that um, is frequently um, misunderstood as it must be a joint venture. It's 25% of the equity contributed in each project. Um, in fact, it can be technical assistance or long-term debt. Um, but the metric still stands um, as OPIC continues to be OPIC. For low-income and low-middle-income countries, that would be um, all the countries but the oil countries, um, that is no longer a requirement. And that means that we have the ability to lend into both greenfield and expansion enterprises that exist that are 100% locally owned. And I think that's very important for what's your ultimate goal is ultimately is economic development. FDI is part of that. Um, so with Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, the requirement is there unless it is a hard infrastructure project or it is women-owned project. So there are still extra flexibilities. Just very quickly, our capacity right now in Central Asia is five billion, but we have a portfolio of 54 million. Um, wow. Historically, 1.2 billion since independence. Wow. Um, and so the question is why? But my five minutes are up, so maybe you'll ask no, no, me no. later. No, 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 yes. <laughs> Tell us why. No, Tell us why. Answer that question, because that's very, very important. Yes. So first off, we invest in privately owned enterprises. Mm. That's a big one. Um, 
there, there is one constraint that I will say is a maya culpa in that we, unlike EBRD and IFC, we do not have offices in the region. We don't have offices anywhere. We're 250 people. It's word of mouth. And we respond to developed projects coming to us. So unless I meet people when I go out there, you may not know about us. Um, Secondarily, the Build Act does not give us the ability to compete with the Chinese based on price. We're not given concessional financing abilities. But all that having been said, we offer long-term fixed rate debt out to 20 years, which is almost unheard of. We are flexible in our structuring. So what am I finding across the board? Sometimes I think that we get so tripped up on using common words that nobody really understands what they are anymore. I, does anyone really even know what corruption is or what rule of law really means when you're talking about investing? To me, it means <coughs> if the government owns the majority of anything, whether it be an enterprise or a sector, I don't want to put my money in there because I know that the, gov that the, the, that the, the judges are not going to find in my favor if there's going to be a dispute. It's being treated evenly. Um, I notice that um, a lot of investors are not open about having resources. They hide their resources. Um, well, as an international lender, I need to be able to see audited financials. I need to not see proxy ownership, but actually transparent ownership. Um, there's a, a lack of understanding of leverage. Um, which is to say that nobody lends 100% to a project. Um, there, needs to, there needs to be equity already in the project. Um, I have learned a great Russian phrase for that, by the way, so I'll say it in English, which is it's so much better than no free lunch. Um, it's um, free cheese is only in a mousetrap. <laughs> it's really much better. <laughs> um, and um, I would say, um, I also really want to applaud what's going on, um, not just in Kazakhstan. I think it's, it's evident that Kazakhstan is, is miles ahead. Um, but some of the changes that I've seen recently are, are the opening of Uzbekistan. Um, and not just for FDI, but the fact <coughs> that there can be trade within the region is really going to be a boom for everybody. I'm going to Tashkent next week, and there are several Kazakh investors that are coming to meet me there. And that's what we want. We want to see the regeneration of you know, the, the regional economy um, and cooperation. Um, finally, I think that uh, many of us here have a, a, a Western bias, myself certainly included. I really don't know the way China works. Um, but I frequently hear in Central Asia, we want to be the Georgians. We want to succeed in the way that the Georgians succeed succeeded, and I don't think anyone remembers what Georgia was like after independence. I remember. It was entropic. It was very bloody. Um, there was not 10, 20 percent, 30 percent privatization of a few enterprises. It was, let's go, everybody, and you know, whoever has the bigger gun wins. Um, and I don't think Central Asia really wants to do that. Um, so if you are going to adopt the, the Chinese more centrally planned model, then uh, I'm not sure anyone really knows how that's going to, to end up, but it's not, it's, not what, it's not the way Westerners would have seen it go. Um, I think that um, you know, Kazakhstan's not the only one that, that is, is taking the first steps into privatization. It might actually be the right thing for your country. We, none of us really know. Um, but as an equity investor, and I'm supporting equity investors, I would not put equity into an enterprise if I'm only buying 10% of the shares and 90% is owned by the government. Because the purpose of equity investment is that when an enterprise gets hurt, they put more money in. But why would you do that if you're not going to be a majority investor? So with that, I would say uneven playing field is the biggest issue. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael, you've been working on trade for USAID. If you, your thoughts, I think, are quite relevant here. Mm -hmm. Indeed it is. Um, anyway, thank, thank you very much, and good evening to all, all of you. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm representing the U.S. Agency for International Development, otherwise known as USAID. 
at the celebration of the Atlanta Council Issues Paper, Soft Infrastructure Development in Central Asia 2020 by R.L. Cohen and James Grant. I've read it, and I can say that this insightful paper is broadly in line with USAID thinking in the region, its challenges and potential, and how organizations like USAID can best support Central Asia's drive for self-reliance. For self I'll spend a few minutes outlining some, some of, uh, outlining some of USAID's activities in Central Asia that aim to address some of the main challenges. Now before I, before I get into this too much, as I told um, as, uh, Amb Ambassador Kazakhanov, I am asked to talk about Central Asia a lot. And uh, notice the title is Central Asia, the, the implication being there's something in common about all these countries and we can make some degree of generalization. You can. Uh, but I regard Kazakhstan as in a league of its own, uh, and, and it's, it's very important to recognize that there's Kazakhstan and then there's the other countries. So please bear that in mind as I speak here. Uh, if I was writing this just about Kazakhstan, it would be a very different uh, address. Um, as noted in the paper, <coughs> uh, much of the region's challenges can be traced to Central Asia's Soviet legacy. That legacy has left these countries with a handful of mostly commodities exports, lack of a diverse range of tradable competitive consumer goods that conform with international standards, underdeveloped infrastructure, low levels of intra-Central Asia trade, caused in part by high cross-border tariff and non-tariff barriers, generally low levels of, F of FDI, I'd say Kazakhstan is an exception to that, an underdeveloped private uh, business sector, and human capacity shortfalls that inhibit good governance, and here I would also mention corruption. One big barrier to high levels of FDI is, a, is the lack of a relatively integrated Central Asia market area with competitive investment rules. In most cases, Central Asian countries have erected high cross-border barriers so prospective investors cannot consider the potential market as Central Asia wide. In many cases, and I've seen this, uh, I can give you some examples. In many cases, it is cheaper to import from distant countries than from a neighboring Central Asia country. And that's because of tariffs and non-tariff barriers. U USAID is working with both the governments and the private sector to streamline customs and other border measures. We think a strongly connected region or a Central Asia common market comprised of over 70 million consumers would be an attractive FDI destination. Now, we don't think this is utopian. The EU started in 1951 with cooperation in two industrial commodities. That's it. And that has evolved and developed in, uh, the EU into a, glo into a global economic power today that we see. Already in Central Asia, there is nascent cooperation in energy trade and export promotion. Several Central Asian countries have great potential in horticultural production, including exports. USAID is working with farmers and agribusinesses in these countries to upgrade qu quality to international standards and develop new markets. A fast-tracked assist to this common market vision is universal WTO membership. Currently, three Central Asian countries are WTO signatories, and a fourth, <coughs> Uzbekistan, has recently relaunched its application. USAID has embedded a WTO expert to work with the relevant Uzbek ministry on the accession process. Accession is going to take some time, but will be a big step forward in economic development for the entire region, not just Uzbekistan. The level of state-owned enterprises throughout Central Asia remains high. A key to achieving higher economic growth rates and income is the strengthening of the private sector and entrepreneurship. Much of USAID's efforts are aimed at building private sector capacity and creation of private sector institutions that can effectively advocate for business-friendly practices in such key areas as transport and logistics. This work, in partnership with our host governments in Central Asia, will help lead to enterprise-led and 
enterprise-led development and support governments on what USAID Administrator Mark Green calls the journey to self-reliance. Now again, because of the time limitations, these are just a few of U USAID's activities that incorporate what Ariel calls soft infrastructure development. But I hope this sample provides a sense of the main thrust of our efforts. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. That's very good. <coughs> Dan, um, you've been involved in Central Asia, especially Kazakhstan, for a long time. Please. Well, John, thank you, and thank you for hosting us. It's always a first-class event here at the Atlantic Council. Mr. Ambassador, congratulations on hitting that 25, number 25 ranking. I know the ambition of Kazakhstan wants to keep climbing, and as you should, but I think back to the mid-90s and President Nazarbayev in, in the 2020 plan, 2030 plan, to be among the 50 most competitive <laughs> nations in the world. So how far you've come, yet still more to do. Um, and you mentioned one of my favorite programs, the Balashek program, in your, your remarks. I look at some of the <coughs> younger Kazakhs out here, and, and that is your future. And, um, and it also what struck me in the early years, and we don't have to look too far to compare and contrast, but the confidence of a leader and the confidence of the people to send your best and brightest around the world to study and having them want to voluntarily and willingly come back. That says something about your country. That <coughs> says something about the future, that the young people see a future back home. And, um, <coughs> and that's, I think, part of the reason I keep going back to Kazakhstan with, you know, with the, that kind of energy and, and, and that type of vision. Um, Tara, just, um, I think I, I'm the vice chairman of the board of the Eurasia Foundation. And, and um, I want to thank you. We are a beneficiary of OPEC funding. We created a private equity fund for small business that works in the Caucasus and um, in Kyrgyzstan. We went to, to some more exotic places and, um, and you were one of the founding, I think you put in seven of the 27 million to launch that fund. And, um, and then Mike, your point on um, the barriers to trade within Eurasia, Back in the, and I, I don't, maybe my gray hair is dating myself by itself, but uh, um, <coughs> in the n late 90s, we commissioned a study looking at the cost of importing uh, raw materials in things like pipes for pipe from within the CIS. In those days, it was CIS, not Eurasia, versus outside Bulgaria and elsewhere. And it was less expensive because of indirect tax and import duties to go outside. And I think that may be something for us to look at in a future study. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't congratulate James and Ariel, world-class paper, and um, we're going on just about a year of us working together. I couldn't be prouder to have the Energy Growth and Security Program at ITIC. You're doing world-class research, and, um, and I think it's unique to put those three together energy, growth, and security. Often they're talked about separately, but you know, you look at the policies of Kazakhstan, they're integrated. Um, and if you take that paper, let's not forget that paper last year, which was the traditional infrastructure. And, and then that paper combined with this paper, I believe, is the most comprehensive set of research on development in Central Asia. It clearly articulates what is needed but then how do you achieve and measure success? And it's not bridges, it's not miles of road or, or, or miles of pipe, but let's look at how we are improving the quality of life and the standard of living for the people in each of these countries. That's what development's all about. And in your paper last year, you touched on it today, $33 billion development gap between now and 2030. That's just for Central Asia. So the two reports make very clear what is needed. And it's more than money. It's more than more cement, steel, and pipe. If we are to deliver innovation, growth, economic diversification, and prosperity. And this is where the soft infrastructure comes in. I sum it up as legal 
regulatory and fiscal regimes. And this is, as John mentioned, where ITIC has worked in Kazakhstan since 1993. We were part of the team helping you throw out 56 Soviet laws and putting in place one unified tax code in 1995. That was revolutionary. Now, you know, it's easy to forget that, but that was groundbreaking. Um, I'm, I also can look at this uniquely through the BRI perspective. ITIC last fall was, was named the only NGO advisor to this tax coordination, BRITICOM, BRI Tax Administration Coordination, headed by the Chinese STA, co-chaired by the Kazakhstan State Revenue Committee, co-chaired by the UAE Federal Tax Authority, um, I think the lady from Cote d'Ivoire and someone from Latin America. The next meeting, the second meeting of that tax coordination group would be in Astana next May. This has the, this platform bringing together tax administrators from all of the BRI countries, in my opinion, has the potential to rival the Washington and Paris consensus organizations because it's led by the developing world. It's not the OECD model where the rich guys make the rules and then persuade the developing world to take the rules. So I think that's a very interesting development that Kazakhstan would be right in the middle of. And don't forget, BRI was given birth in Kazakhstan 2013, President Xi, hosted by President mm. Nazarbayev in Astana. But as we talk about all of these things, and it's really easy with the, the development programs. Okay, we've got a new law passed. Well, we've, for all of us that have worked in this space, that's the start. Having good laws passed by a parliament, that's a tough task in many of these places. But that's just the start of the project. It's implementation. It's capacity building. Soft infrastructure cannot be imported. Know-how can be shared. Know-how can be transferred. But it must be institutionalized and internalized. You know, we can help the governments create rules, a framework to achieve transparency. And key, key, and this is something that I said repeatedly when I was in Wuzhen for that conference in China, a level playing field. We shouldn't be afraid of BRI if it's transparent and has a level playing field. I mean, a country can get in a debt trap without the Chinese debt. Look at Argentina. <laughs> so, but the, the hardest thing in Central Asia, I think, is changing the mindset and the psychology. Even now, coming on 30 years of independence, that government builds the framework, a set of rules, and get out of the way. Get out of the way so entrepreneurs and business can flourish and foster innovation and growth. And yes, take risks. Take risks <coughs> and lose their money and not come looking to the government to be bailed out. Now, here we are about 10 years post the global crisis. Of course, the region is being led by Central, by Kazakhstan. Um, head and shoulders. But it's really exciting to see what's happened over the last two, three years in Uzbekistan. By my two visits, I believe it's real. You hear that, you heard it at the IMF World Bank meetings. So we've got the leadership of Kazakhstan. You've got other countries blossoming in the region. There's funding available through the BRI and hopefully more from the US government. So I think the future is bright. But it will require soft infrastructure, as detailed in Ariel and James' paper, to make it all come together. And I think most of this learned crowd in the room have studied history. History has repeatedly proved that there are three pillars to successful development. The three pillars, you must have a competitive tax regime. You must have a balance between what the state gets and what the investor gets if you're going to have risk taking. And we're not talking about holidays, 
incentives, competitive, stable, predictable. Number two, low bureaucracy, less government red tape, fewer government regulations. And the third pillar, respect for property rights. These are the three fundamental pillars of soft infrastructure, and they've been proven. You do these three things, you will attract and you will retain investment, and this will deliver growth and prosperity for your people. Okay, uh, Dan, thank you. Uh, you laid out some very important principles for development, completely consistent with, with the paper that Ariel presented here. There, there are a number of themes I think we probably won't want to look at, although we don't have that much time to do so. Um, first, Tara, you mentioned the importance of a level playing field. And that's, in one phrase, Ariel's soft infrastructure and, and Dan's point about those principles necessary for development. So how do you see the level playing field right now as someone who's putting U.S. government money on the line? Well, what I mean by U.S. playing field is for the investors that are taking the risk. Because of course. we're lending to the private enterprises whether or not they're going in or they're expanding. Um, I think that unless you're already very powerful, the majority of investors do not feel like there is a level playing field. Um, I think in certain countries they may feel a little bit more protected than in other of the five countries. Um, but what I said earlier about um, not uh, investors not even being willing to acknowledge what assets they have is evidence of that. Um, and I think that once there truly is an even playing field, meaning implementation of those laws being, being implemented fairly and evenly, I think that you will see a lot of FDI from your own citizens that the returning assets will build the economy. It will not just be U.S. and Chinese FDI. Okay, Ara, you just um, produced this um, wonderful paper. So your perspective, when do you think we'll begin to see this sort of implementation that Tara was just describing? Um, I'm a lapsed lawyer. I would hammer at every opportunity that if you don't have local, competent, judiciary, courts, you will export this wonderful industry to London Correct. or to Stockholm and people instead of going to Astana, to Nur Sultan, to AIFC to adjudicate there, will go to the London Court of Arbitration. So the challenge is having the, the core of the judiciary that is A, educated and competent, but B, is not corrupt. They're not taking bribes. They're not using attorneys to bring an envelope with cash and give it to the judge to rule in favor of the one who gave the higher, um, the higher uh, bribe. So that's one part. The other, the, it, it's a complex it's mechanism. Yes. It's not easy. And as the joke uh, goes, it, it takes, when they asked, they asked an English gentleman, how come he has such a wonderful law? And said, oh, you, just, you just water it for 300 years. Uh, <laughs> it takes time. It takes time. We have to be realistic in our expectations. Unfortunately, the shadow, the giant shadow that China casts is not necessarily in the direction of transparent and independent judiciary. Um, I was born in the Soviet Union, so one, you, you mentioned a Russian phrase, there's another Russian phrase which is called the telephone law. law. Telefonne prava. So th that's a, a, a ruling in court that is based on a phone call the judge gets how to rule. <laughs> so that, that is not a good thing. The second big component is the bureaucratic apparatus that, as Dan correctly pointed out, has to be as small as possible, as competent as possible, and actually has, I would venture to say, as little power. I, you need to regulate. I'm not some crazy libertarian from Cato Institute, but <laughs> is there anybody from Cato Institute here? No. Uh, but you, you need to regulate, but please, please, please regulate at 
ad minimis, right, to, to the minimum uh, that is necessary to run your economy. Take a look at places like Singapore, Hong Kong, etc. Um, so how you get these bureaucrats that are competent, well compensated, not corrupt, well, Kazakhstan is an example. They send a whole bunch of people to study abroad. Uh, and that's pretty much where I, I would leave it now. There are probably other important components in terms of regulation um, that allow investors to uh, compete in the level playing field. Okay, I need to note right now that the Atlantic Council has no position for or against libertarianism. Okay, I agree. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'd, I'd like to pursue uh, a point, I think especially made by you, Michael, regarding the opening to of markets within Central Asia. Uh, I, I agree that the developments in Uzbekistan over the past three years have been striking and important, particularly on this front. So your sense as to what this means for how the region moves forward? Well, uh, I've been dealing mostly with the U.S. Uh, when I was at USTR at the White House uh, with uh, the, our Central Asia trade relationship, and it, it's a plurilateral relationship with all the countries. and, and and I can tell you that the, the the lack of a the ability to see the region as a as a seamless mark common market you can you can set up a tractor factory in one in one of these countries and you can supply the whole market with that 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 uh, the inability to do that as a result of all these uh, tariff and non tariff barriers mm -hmm. was crippling to to investment and and in, in fact. It was crippling to existing investment. Once, once the investor figured out they couldn't do that, um, that there were all these tariffs that have been set up. So uh, I see that as an extremely important task. Now, Uzbekistan, I, I do think it's going to take a long time. Uh, and I think we need to calibrate our expectations. Uzbekistan is making all the right noises right now. The atmospherics are dramatically better. People are getting visas. There, there's... there's uh, uh, dialogues, uh, channels that are you know, committees that are being set up to 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 discuss these things. Having said that, and I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to denigrate any of that or <clears throat> discount any of that. If you look today on this date, and if you look at what the Uzbek trade and uh, trade regime is, the tariff schedule, it's extremely high still. They haven't made a lot of changes. <coughs> I think they'll come. Certainly, they will with WTO, but. We need, as something that was alluded to by Ariel, I think we need more capacity building and more explaining to the, the government and the private sector of the benefits of open markets. Uh, I, I don't think we have real honest dialogue going on right now. I think Uzbeks, they know they can't continue. They know they can't go on like this. Are you talking about Uzbekistan or the United States? U Uzbeks. <laughs> okay. And, and uh, they can't go on like this, but they, they need to do something. But they're also concerned. They say, well, look, and if you, talk, you have some friends and, you know, there may be some alcohol involved in this uh, and maybe a late evening, they'll say, look, we know we have to change. But what would happen right now if we were to drop our tariffs? We don't have enough tradable goods. Right. And we're just going to get into a, 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 a trade deficit very quickly and, 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 and get into a balance of payments problem. And the next thing we hear on the horizon is the clarion call, the IMF. Mm. So what we need to do is, is take some time, develop our economy, de develop some tradable goods, and then we will liberalize. How long are we talking about? Decades? So we just need to, and I think some of the more developed countries uh, can help on this, to reassure uh, countries like Uzbekistan that if you, if you develop a, a competitive, relatively open trade and investment system, the heavens will not fall. And, and I think that's, that's something that we, we at USAID need to start doing a little more. Okay, I'll, make, I'll go explore one more theme. This has been a remarkably like-minded panel, <laughs> with one possible exception. Um, Dan, I think you spoke in a rather positive way about the Belt and Road Initiative. And Tara, you spoke about part of your efforts to offer a counterpoint or a, a competitive position vis-a-vis -vis Belt and Road. 
Um, I think as an American who watches um, Chinese power, that we should be deeply concerned about their ambitions and about their um, willingness and ability to manipulate even our own system. So I'll give you, Dan, the first word. Uh, is BRI an unvarnished opportunity? Or is this something that we should look at with a certain amount of skepticism? And then I'll give Tara a chance to address that. Well, too. I think we need to, we and any country that is participating needs to have their eyes fully open. No question about that. Um, you know, following the missteps in Malaysia where it, the programs were stopped, renegotiated at roughly half the price, uh, following the surrender of the port in Sri Lanka, significant steps have been made for transparency. The World Bank procurement system has put in place. I mean, in fact, with the, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, over in Beijing, you'll see a lot of your old pals who aged out at the World Bank are now working in Beijing. So those systems have taken over there. Um, and, you know, I, I look at it, you know, some of our reaction, and, and look, I've been doing this NGO stuff since the, the mid 80s, so I really feel like I've spent my life promoting free markets and free people. Um, but a trillion dollars in development, you know, spread to some of the poorest countries in the world, if it can be done in a transparent, managed way, in a way with a level playing field that a Chinese company does not get a certain competitive advantage over an American or a European company. Um, I mean, it, it has economically the potential to be a Marshall Plan. But we were not only putting money, we were also exporting our values. Make no mistake, there's a values side of this, a foreign policy side of this with China. Um, I'm not particularly comfortable with that, but show me where you get free money. Um, so, you know, it is a disruptor. You know, most of this stuff came from the West, North, South, West, East. Now, a trillion dollars coming from East, South, East, West. Okay, that's a good, honest answer. Tara? Um, I think that everything that you said, all of those conditions, would make BRI very positive. Um, but, <laughs> but that's not reality, right? So, so there are strings attached to this concessional financing. And it's not just free money, um, and it's generally not free. Um, it's, it, seems con it seems concessional, but it um, is usually highly collateralized. Um, but they frequently even import their own labor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so not only do you not get the economic benefit of it, but then you have a new population <laughs> because they're not leaving. Um, so generally speaking, um, I think that since we all agree that even playing field and competition and all of those Western values are good for everybody, then there, there can't be anything negative about countering solitary efforts, it, whether that be the US or Europe or, or even Russia. Um, it, it, there, there needs to be, um, and I think frankly, Central Asian governments do a phenomenal job of playing us against each other uh, to their own benefit, which is frankly they what should. they should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so all in all, um, I don't think that, you know, politically I think that our position is that BRI is bad. But from a Central Asian perspective, if you get a new port out of it and you negotiate it well and you know the actual terms of the agreement, it might be something good. Especially if you get a new port out of it as being a landlocked region. <laughs> Ariel. <laughs> okay, you do get something, but look, you look at our own America's history, these big development projects, sure, you ended up with a dam, but you also ended up with a lot of development, a lot of employment, a lot of economic generation. If you're bringing in workers from China, you're not going to get you're not going to get that, and and so I think that's a you're, the economic returns are not as high as they might imagine. Um, I was uh, looking at the figures of um, comparative trade in Africa. The U.S. has sixty billion dollars a year 
Russia has 20 and growing. Putin just had 54 heads of state in Sochi right after they moved into Syria and Putin had a successful uh, trip to the Gulf trying to sell nuclear reactors, anti-air missiles and whatnot. And China, and China has $240 billion trade. So it's four times more than we do. And there was a book, um, I think it was JFK's book, uh, While Britain Slept. While America slept, the Chinese are eating our lunch in, Ch in Africa. Mm -hmm. I do believe, I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, but I think the Chinese, I know for fact, because I follow oil and gas, the Chinese won every bid for every oil and gas project over a billion dollars in Central Asia since 1990s, to the great chagrin of their Russian friends. I, I don't want to offend anybody, and I don't want to, as they used to say at the, at the Heritage Fo Foundation where I work, securitize everything. But if you think that this is only about Chinese exports, please see me after this panel. It is not. It is a geopolitical mm -hmm. and geoeconomic game. And while this is a cliche, and I was scolded by editors not to use it, if you take the Chinese national game of Go, it's a game of enveloping your enemy and gaining space, gaining territory. And you can play it for days. You can play it for hours and for days. Centuries. Well, <laughs> when it comes to geopolitics, it, it's probably going to be decades and centuries. What I'm trying to say is that if you're not playing, you're losing. If you won't play, you will lose. And with all due respect, $60 billion for the rest of the world, when Belt and Road is a trillion, they actually talk about, talked about two trillion over three, 30 years. Let's say they talk about two trillion, but it's going to be almost a trillion. It is still, 940 billion more than the 60 billion. Okay, questions right here and then there. <coughs> One question, please. Let them introduce themselves. My name is Walter Jurassic. A fascinating talk. I like this Heritage Foundation, what you had to say. But the question can we understand the Chinese? investment and the private investments when there is not my money I don't care I don't lose it or not lose it is money of government and people of China but very briefly what do you think about the small businesses in Kazakhstan there's a direct question to ambassador do you have any opportunities for small businesses in Kazakhstan uh, wait, sorry. No. Can, can you get the mic, please. Yes, I just uh, thank you for your question. I think that the small businesses, this is the, um, the goal. And uh, in his State of the Nation address, President Tokayev said that uh, all emphasis will be put on the small businesses. So what is going on now, he's uh, watching very carefully of all the obstacles and barriers and all the kind of uh, uh, problems that the small businesses faces uh, in Kazakhstan. Uh, so we, we need to give them, as we say, the level playing field. And uh, we, 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 we need to provide them kind of uh, greenhouse conditions so that they can flourish. And that is the goal of the president. And uh, I think if you, have, if you need more information, there is a, uh, a State of the Nation address copy uh, in the corridor. You can read it and uh, it's, it's, it's it's clearly mentioned uh, in, in, his, in his statement. Thank you. Okay, then a question over here and then over there. Okay, your third. No, back there, Thank here, you. and then you. Sure, hi, Alex Sanchez, Jane Defense. Question for Ariel. 
In early October, Kazakhstan held the um, World Investor Week. Uh, there were six cities in Kazakhstan that held meetings, Almaty, Nur Sultan, Aktau, and others. Then I know that last week, the Kazakh UK Intergovernmental Commission met in London. There was the Kazakhstan Global Forum, Investment Forum, sorry, and I think there was, which was co-organized by the um, <coughs> Financial Times. I was wondering, where do these fall under your, where do these events fall under your recommendation, page 20 of your, of your report, that the AIFC should become a gatekeeper for PPPs and all kind of investment, uh, potential investment projects in Kazakhstan. The Kazakhstan government is obviously trying to bring more investment. So what's, is the AIFC actually doing anything to become the gatekeeper that you recommend? Thank you. Well, AIFC, Astana International Financial Center, is a new organization. Uh, it was conceived in 2015. It was inaugurated in 2018 by the first president of Sultan Azarbaev. I was at the inauguration. Uh, it has its work in front of it. And its major work is getting Kazakh and regional businesses to float on their stock exchange. It is a combination of uh, a trading platform that is based on NASDAQ, has NASDAQ technology, has investors from the Gulf, from China, from the United States, as brokers, etc. So I am not in the position to tell them what to do, but between the uh, stock exchange and the arbitration platform and other functions they have, I don't know if they have the bandwidth right, right, right now to be the gatekeeper for investment. I think there are other actors in Kazakhstan who probably would like to do that. And the best gatekeeper for foreign investment is rule of law, good court system, efficient bureaucracy, and all these wonderful things that we're discussing in our report. Ariel, I, I would use the term gateway, not gatekeeper. Right. Okay. Good. Thank you. My name is Shafkat Sabirov. I am from uh, Institute for Security Studies and Development Central Asia. Uh, I just came from Kazakhstan, so I have uh, just a few remarks regarding oh, this report. Uh, is this okay? No? Two minutes. Two minutes, yes. Okay. Uh, the first one uh, for Kazakhstan. Uh, let me just uh, change uh, crackdown on corruption for to improve soft infrastructure. You know uh, how big is the road? Uh, Western Europe to Western China, it's over 5,200 miles. It means right now uh, we don't have in uh, Kazakhstan enough uh, soft infrastructure. It means gas station, shops, and everything. That's a hard infrastructure. Yeah. No. Yes, uh, it's hard infrastructure. Uh, it's they uh, they the define so soft the infrastructure. Term soft infrastructure refers to laws, regulations, so and, and things like, and institutions. Yeah, okay. Uh, for the next one, for Uzbekistan, I came just one month ago from Uzbekistan for banking sector. More than 80% of banking sector remains under the state control. Uh, it's, uh, there is a just uh, one question. There are no reason for commercial banks because mm -hmm. uh, uh, about 6-7% of population has a bank account. Six to seven percent. Yes. Uh, so, b b based the ambassador on was ambassador to Uzbekistan. What were you doing there? Not letting them Just bank. Not it's making any money. <laughs> based <laughs> on uh, central bank information for the first half of this year, it's just about six seven percent of wow. the bank account. So yeah. it's uh, the, there are no commercial interests. Right. Thank you. No. Uh, thank uh, you. Uh, we, uh, we, no, we have to give other people a chance. Yeah. yeah. Please. Okay. Okay. Next question. If you if you have time. I would really appreciate getting your comments okay. in, in. Thank you. If you can send me an email, I'll give you my Thank you. address. Can you do that? Sure. Thank right. you. Right there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, fascinating panel. Uh, Bill Veal, uh, President Emeritus of the U.S. Kazakhstan Business Association. 
Um, I was delighted to hear a reference, I think a representative from uh, AID mentioned the European, or alluded to the uh, European coal and steel community as one of the uh, formative models that this region could uh, consider. The problem has been the lack of, of regional uh, uh, trade within this area, and I think uh, the focus in the, your paper, Ariel, on uh, the, especially the non-tariff barriers is really uh, absolutely key. I understand there's a political economy in each of these countries, and finding uh, uh, new revenue streams uh, there for uh, people who are going to be dislocated if you do try and reform this. I mean, these uh, uh, wealth streams that come from border activities and so forth, things that impede the trade. But the uh, overall uh, point uh, for foreign investors looking at this area, having a quilt work of different rules and regulations is uh, absolutely uh, uh, a deterrent to uh, investment to, to the kind of scale of market that is needed for uh, companies to come into this area. So I would encourage you to keep pushing on that front. And the C5 seems to me to be the, the logical place for this. Years ago when I was in the Foreign Service as a junior officer, I was in Strasbourg in the early 70s. And right at that point, what was going on in Europe was that the ministries of all the European countries were coordinating and having a, a series of meetings with each other to harmonize the laws and the regulations. And that's what really the C5 should begin doing, is to getting a, a working groups of ministerial groups together and start uh, hammering out where are we not together on these issues and how can we make these things. Because once you can get that going, you'll incentivize uh, the movement away from uh, getting revenue from uh, these uh, impediments at borders. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ex excellent. Other questions? Good okay. point, Dan. Right here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have some behind. Then you'll, you'll be next. Go ahead. Okay. Hello. My name is Maruf Mumenov. Um, my question is for um, Dr. Korn, and I think you're uh, really qualified to maybe uh, kind of comment and answer that question. Uh, question is regarding. I'm from Uzbekistan originally, but I've been living in the states, so um, travel oftenly, do some projects. Uh, but they question need you is. Back home. Uh, I'm sorry. They need you back home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. I can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, question is about a recent comment um, by uh, Wilbur Ross when there was he was asked about you know WTO ascension of Uzbekistan, and uh, he made a comment that there could be some complications if Uzbekistan chooses to uh, join Eurasian uh, Economic Union, and so and it seems like a. Uzbekistan is kind of heading towards that, and then there are other countries in the region who are already members of the uh, Eurasian, you know, uh, Union, but they're also members of WTO. Um, do you think that there's a two uh, separate uh, issues, and they cannot be, you know, uh, it cannot exist together harmoniously? And what would what would you uh, recommend? Or what would be comments about that? Thank you. I was at a dinner with a very senior states, statesman last night. Uh, by the rules of engagement, I'm not allowed to say who that is or where it was the dinner. But one thing that very distinguished public servant said was that the United States is well advised to treat every country, small or large, a competitor or an ally, with respect. And if a country makes its choice to join an economic bloc that I criticized, I wrote papers casting doubts about the raison d'etre of the Eurasian Economic Union, accusing Russia of trying to establish its economic sphere of influence in the region. Uh, but if that's the decision the country makes and it's sovereign leaders make, let them face the consequences. But I if it doesn't violate the rules of WTO, I do not see why they cannot be the members of WTO. And if I may, in addition, I do not see why we would, our government would go and undermine WTO. And I better stop at that. Uh, I I'll just add a point here. Uh, there's no question there are countries that are members of both. Therefore, this could happen with Uzbekistan. Uh, 
But I would agree with Ariel that the Eurasian Economic Union is not the path to economic openness or economic development. And if the government in Tashkent were to head in that direction, Ariel's right, it's their sovereign right to make those decisions. It would seriously undermine um, the narrative they're selling that they're truly interested in reform. Okay, we have the question here and then we can go back. Uh, in general, I agree with what was said and what is written in the paper, but I think one thing is uh, missing, it's education. Uh, who will be uh, implementers and operators of soft uh, infrastructure? You see, there was a joke in Soviet times that uh, uh, no matter what Soviet factories uh, assembles, uh, become uh, even bicycle becomes a military tank. The same, Russia. what I see in the region is uh, five stands, they are reproducing post-Sovietism. And I think uh, we should keep in mind that uh, it's mostly all about uh, education, uh, capacity building, uh, so we should think about uh, training centers on soft infrastructure. So this is the case. Can, can well, I please. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so far, uh, I see two institutions in Kazakhstan that produce uh, high quality people. Uh, one of them is interning with us at uh, uh, International Tax and Investment Center, is Agbota. She's a graduate of Nazarbayev University, and the other one is a management uh, is a management university or institute in in Almaty. Kimet, right? Can you do more and better? Of course. Can you continue sending people to study overseas? Of course. And in that respect, uh, I want to point out that while on the economic side and in some cases on the legal side, a lot of folks from Central Asia are studying with Western books, Western models, Western institutions. On the security and politics side, a lot of people are still studying in Moscow. And I do have a question about that. Do you really want to have your 20-year-olds 20 today be infused with kind of ideas that Moscow is generating today? That's my question. I'll well, leave it at that. Well, I also couldn't help but think about um, you know, the higher economic school in Moscow, the Kiev economic school, that were made possible because of USAID in the mm -hmm. early days. They have spun off. They've graduated from the funding. They've got independent funding. But they are world-class Western thought institutions. And there was a lot of criticism in the early years of Nazarbayev University by the other universities. Oh, it's sucking all the funding from us. It was a disruptor. I mean, you think about the old systems, um, the professors, I mean, we think tenure's bad in America, <laughs> but think about those professors. Think about how you could bribe and get the grades, how well, your you parents still would do that. bribe <laughs> to get the spot in there. At Nazarbayev University, you've got a, a Japanese president, you've got an international board of trustees, it's run as a world-class institution comparable to you know, MIT or University of Michigan. And you work just as hard there. Or, and then you come out and you're admitted into University of Chicago. I mean, world-class going to world-class. And so this is what excites me is that these dinosaurs, the other universities, may become extinct. And there'll be more Nazarbayev like universities around Kazakhstan. I mean, people look at AIFC, oh, they've got special treatment, it's a special zone. Well, I look at that as a disruptor. My vision is in 10 years time, what they're doing in the AIFC should be all of Kazakhstan. Thank you, one more question over there and then we're done. Oh, yeah, my name is Richard Spooner, I'm with Valmont Industries. Um, I want to thank you all for your very interesting comments, very interesting event. Um, it's been said that Kazakhstan is way ahead of all the other Central Asian republics in terms of making uh, certain, taking steps, developments, including things that relate to soft infrastructure. Kazakhstan is a member of the Eurasian Economic Union. 
our company is considering building a plant in Kazakhstan. And one thing that's very attractive to us is the ability to export to Russia as part of the Eurasian Economic Union. So if Uzbekistan decides that that's the best thing for them, I really don't understand uh, advising against that. Thank you. Final word. Okay, we have a reception. I agree. I'd like, to, I'd like to thank our panel for a wonderful thank conversation. You. And I'd like to thank you all for coming. And thank you, Ambassador Terzakama. Okay, comment. let's do a photo. Come on up here, Mr. Ambassador. Picture. Take a picture? Here's sure.